shows respect for the opponent, however great the difference in grade may be. And of course, when Judo first came to London, it came uh, mainly as a form of self-defense, didn't it? Yes, that's what people were interested in. They'd heard of it in that way. Uh, Tani came over and uh, he popularized it by exhibition. So it was something mysterious and magical. And it was Dr. Carno that took the best parts of what he thought was Judo from the various Jiu-Jitsu schools. The Jiu-Jitsu schools, yes, they were kept secret and they relied for their effect, a lot of their techniques, on surprise mainly. And they weren't mechanically necessarily very efficient, but they relied on surprise, you see. Now he rationalized them and he pu made them public so that it became a contest of balance and speed and endurance. And that was uh, valuable for the uh, building up of the health and the physique and useful for life. Well, now we're coming on to breakfalls, and I think one of the major points here is that the, the whole of the breakfall must be taken and distributed throughout the body. Yes, people try and stay off the ground when they're frightened of the ground, and that means that in the end they put out a wrist or something to support themselves, or an elbow, and it means the whole shock comes on that one point, and of course it gets badly damaged. And it's the same in life, when you have a disaster in life, the thing is not to try and avoid it, but to take it with your whole personality and then jump up again afterwards. Dr. Connor used to stress the applications of this to life. They're not at all frightened of the ground. They're meeting the ground with a whole of themselves. Now, I think in this particular sequence that we're seeing now, um, the, the men are rather old. I mean, obviously they had to practice breakfalls in those days for quite some considerable time. Yes, they were, weren't trained from childhood as they are now, or were then in Japan, so that um, uh, older people are generally a bit frightened of falling. I don't think I've ever seen this particular forward break fall used, and in fact, when I was taught it, I was taught to turn my head to the right so that my nose wouldn't get bur buried in the mat. But have you seen it used? <laughs> no, never, because it simply doesn't arise in judo throw the man onto his face, there's, there's no particular advantage in it. I suppose if one's caught from uh, behind and your, your feet are pulled from you, you might feet. possibly use it, but I've never seen it done. No, I can't say I have either in whatever it is, 50 years. Now here with GK, Mr. Koizumi, we're going to see how he exaggerates um, in order that you'll be able to understand what he's doing. And he's breaking the balance, he's pushing onto one point, isn't he? Yes, if you want to turn a chair over, 
the thing to do would be to balance it on one leg first, on the tip of one leg, and then with a very little movement you could spin the whole chair over. But if you tried to spin it over when it's flat on its four feet, it's rather difficult. So these are bra this is what we call breaking the balance to the different corners. Isn't it? There are, in fact, I think, eight corners that you can break to. Yes, for analysis, they count it in eight, of course. It's, uh, directions are infinite, aren't they? Here, the man defending is, uh, is just using the body to preserve his balance and lower his center of gravity when he's attacked without making any positive defense with his hands or with the leg. This is somewhat similar to what we've seen earlier. Yes, this is using the whole body as a unity, the man on the right. His body moves as a unit in one piece in that movement. It goes right from the tip of the toe right up. You can see the left toe. It comes onto the left toe tip and right up through the um, whole body up to the hand. This was a feature of Mr. Coyne's style, as a matter of fact. And again, we're going to see now how, when he defends, he seems to drop his hips right down. Uh, in fact, if you compare the obi, uh, you'll see how low he gets sometimes compared with his opponents. Yes, that, that would be the center of gravity is lowered. Now here he's holding him just by the body, without touching with the hands at all, just by retaining the balance on top of the opponent. Daishalin isn't a technique that one sees today. It's, no, it's rather rare. Sort of ideal, ideal form. The man's brought off balance and then pulled right over. You notice the, the, the thrower keeps his posture very well. Yes. He, he ends up in a good balanced posture, so he could take another opponent if necessary after the throw. Here we've got the, the, the hand techniques, and it seems to, uh, in the first one, pull like this, indicating he's going to throw to the right, deceiving the man, and then turning over and taking him to the left. He's using the reaction, isn't he? Yes. yes. But you can really see how the hands have to be used in this, can't you? It, the hands and the body. Yes. It's transmitted only through the hands. There's no uh, catching with the leg. Did you grip the leg there or just put the yes, hand behind? Yes, no, he just put the hand behind, he didn't grip it. That's a, a very old type of throw, but it might well work out of sheer surprise today. Again, if you compare the belts, you can see yeah. how he gets right down. When the man resists, then he just lifts him up. Oh, that's the straight throw. Now we're going to see that where there's a resistance. Resistance, he drops, and then he lifts in the tsurikomi, lifting hip. He keeps his posture very well at the end of the throw, doesn't fall on top of the other man. And considering uh, the, the, the other man seems quite a bit heavier than he is, yes. he's maintaining his balance very yes. well. You see that posture at the yeah. end? Very controlled and balanced. Rather nice you want to take a fall from that. Uh, yes. I wouldn't like to be there. <laughs> no. <laughs> See it's slow now. He's crept his round the back, lifted him up on his hips and walked away virtually, isn't he? Yes. Still keeping his balance very yes. well. The man's tried a left honeygoshi there. Yes. He's slipped past and pushed his hip through. Again, the posture is well kept. Screen, okay, this is a very old one. I almost never see it.
thirties, yeah. That was the sort of throw that used to be kept absolutely secret, and it used to be a great surprise. And this would have belonged to one particular school, perhaps? Yes, very likely, yes. Somewhere in a place like Nagasaki. Now, there it is. And he's turned around, yeah, hasn't he? Yes. Look at the man. To face him. Sure. Yes. Present, yes. Well, this is one of the commonest and best throws in Judah. Yes. Very it's more like a gake. Uh, Oh, sort of gake, isn't it? Yes, I suppose we'd think of it like that, yes. Of course, this is a judo of, what, 50, nearly 50 years ago. Yes. But he's pulled the man down to pin him onto his right leg before he sweeps it away. Yes. That used to be done with a, with a sort of blow of the heel at the back of the leg. So that it would numb the leg? It would numb the leg. No, it's, it's, but just there, it goes in. Used to, yes, used to strike at the opposite leg. But that's not uh, allowed now. The feature of his style is that he keeps the arms well separated. Mr. Cousin. Mr. Cousin's yeah. style, yes. Uh, kind of about some, yeah, I think this is now forbidden, but it used to be quite a, uh, effective, especially in self-defense. That's uh, obviously it's a variation of old I think you can still see Kanibasami occasionally. Oh, really? Yes. It's quite a dangerous throw, but it's a great surprise for the other man if he doesn't know about it. Because he's a smaller man and he can he can get in and under on that end. seem to pin quite a lot. Yes, that's the okay. You see, but they, the arms are wide. Yeah. It? And um, that was one of, one of the features of his style. Quite disconcerting uh, when met for the first time. Did it make him seem vulnerable to attack? Well, no, he got very serious. In theory, of course, it has some uh, weaknesses, but he was very skillful at defending those weaknesses. When he's throwing here, Makikomi, he has some sort of consideration from the man, for the man underneath, not yes. exactly falling on top of him, no. but just pinning him to the mat. Yes, yes, his right hand's coming out and taking most of, the, uh, of his own weight, so he's not coming out on the man's ribs. These throws we've seen more and more uh, in the past maybe five years. Um, were they quite common in the past? Well, they were, uh, they come from uh, jujitsu, some of them were used against men with armor. It was a bit difficult to raise high into the air. But they often brought the man down on the shoulder tip. So they were not encouraged in Britain for a long time. Because one of the important things at judo is the Ren Nakawaza, and not just doing two throws, but sometimes as many as three and or four. I mean, it can be like a chess combination, yes, two or three moves there, there it is, against the resistance. That's a dumb coach she followed by Hanegoshi. He resists. He resists the Hanegoshi and then he goes into Osotokai.
These, of course, are idealized forms. They're like the sentences in a book on grammar. They're perfectly constructed. And in actual practice, we attempt to get it as clear as this, but we don't always succeed. No, but you've got to try for the you've ideal got to try, thing. Yes, just as when we're speaking English, we're trying to talk correctly, but sometimes our sentences get. I think a lot of people, when they're practicing judo, um, they think, well, I can only ever get half in, so I'll only do my uchikomi from that half. Um, and then they automatically then can only do a quarter. <laughs> I, th yes. I think you've got to try for the full, the stretching. Yes. Now, well, now we come on to Nagano Kata. And I think here we, we have two extremes. Um, a, a very tall man as Uki, Uke, and a very small one as Tori. Yes, it's never so convincing when the big man is doing the throwing, although the principles are the same. And what we're going to see, we're only going to sit on one side, on the right side. I think one of the important things of uh, Naginokata is that you actually have to make the throw. There, you'll notice that Uke um, has crossed his legs. Yes, he does, yes. That was the old style, and it was to protect the vital parts from kick right. after you were thrown in jiu-jitsu. The, the legs were crossed. Now, you see there, the yes. leg comes over so that the, the vital parts are protected. Now they tend to open the legs, which um, might be easier to fall, but it does, in theory, leave you open to uh, an attack by some other person. Now here, uh, you notice the man moved his left hand to the inside of the arm so that he couldn't be strangled as he got him into the Katagaruma position. Yes, some of these moves want explaining. For most of these hip throws, uh, it's very easy for uh, okay, uh, for Tori rather. It's very e easy for Tori, for the small man, yes. Because he's already down. Yeah. yeah. Those first two steps are, are meant to uh, the 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 man receiving the throw, so to speak, the victim. Two steps are taken, and then unconsciously he's expecting a third. That's the, the psychology behind it. If you do a thing twice, then the third one is expected. Of course, this is arranged so that... Um... That's right. Now this one's very easy on the pavement because the, sh the boot or the shoe slides along the pavement very easily. It's much harder on a judo mat. And much harder on those mat with mats, which in those days were coconut covered in canvas. <laughs> step to move the right foot round and away so you can do your do the sweep. Yes, as the man is expecting uh, the same step as before. Over uh, here, he's expecting, that's the second step, he's expecting the third one now and it changes. I mean, this for the purpose of the demonstration, it's a leg throw. Um, such a small man probably going in on such a big man would go in under him almost with a hip throw in this Uchimata. It's become gradually very yeah. much nearer a hip throw. So if there is this disparity, I think you need to take care to make sure it is a leg throw. It comes in the leg section. Yes, that's right. And he follows him through, doesn't he, looking at him? Yes, that again is, a, is an inheritance from Jiu-Jitsu where you were expected to, uh, to remain alert even after having made a successful throw. Again, like we saw with Mr. Koizumi, he goes and takes the man in one direction, 
then moves in the other, and then finally throws it. You have to exaggerate, I think, a little bit, don't you, in Magnavata? Yes, it's a demonstration, really. It's like a, a teacher teaching English. He speaks with exaggerated perfection so that the students will get the correct accent. different people have different ways of doing Nagano Kata. Um, how much can it vary? Well, quite my experience is quite a bit. But again, you trained in another area of the country from where I mainly trained. And um, I imagine you find some number of differences, don't you? Yes, I do, actually. Sometimes it's the speed, but I think this is something that uh, you work out for yourself. Um, you can't avoid the principles, like in Katakuruma, moving your left hand to the inside of the sleeve, so he, he strangles you. Well, this is you, actually. Oh, this is me, just after I have a stroke. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Have you come back from Japan, then? Or? Oh, yes, I've been back about two years. left and right I did have, but they're mainly leg throws because I have a very long leg. How important do you think it is to have a technique on both sides? Well, I think it's very important, but uh, again, people don't necessarily agree with that. Some of them tend to specialise on one side, but I think there's something lost. And did you find in Japan that most of the, uh, the Japanese, well, the top Japanese players had techniques on both sides? Not all of them, by any means, no, but uh, I thought some of the best ones he had, yes, and had a variety of techniques too. The judo here looks very upright compared with a, a lot of the judo that's played today. Um, what do you think about that? Well, we were setting a sort of model in those days. So we didn't want to set a model of bent judo. When it first came here, um, judo was introduced, I think, basically into Britain by Tani, yeah. who in fact had to use um, self-defense as a means of pr promoting it by going on the stage. Yes. Yes, his managers used to offer five or ten pounds to anyone who could stand up to him for five or ten minutes. And he had a vast experience against boxers, wrestlers, some out to men and so on. But he became very famous because I remember Bernard Shaw wrote about him in Ma Major Barber, wasn't it? Yes, that's right. He does. And um, Conan Doyle also wrote about it in the uh, return of uh, Sherlock Holmes. Well, here he's using the legs to, to pin the man, first of all, getting through and in, and obviously keeping very close body contact. on both sides. Would you say that it's absolutely necessary to study groundwork? Yes, I think so. Otherwise, um, your judo is incomplete. Um, it's meant to be a training for life and not to become a highly specialized thing like uh, tennis, where there are only about sort of four different shots. But it's meant to become a general training for life so that after this you can undertake other activities like um, shifting coal sacks or doing carpentry or something like that and you'll be able to use the body properly. 
even sitting at a typing table and typing, you'll have a good posture. And your body will be vigorous and both sides will be developed. And what Chico is showing at the moment is some of the basic moves. Yes, how to ground bring, bring life to the legs, especially. A lot of people, the consciousness of the body and the trunk and the legs is very slight. If you uh, examine the brains, the, the representation of the legs and the trunk is very small in the an ordinary brain, but in a trained man, it's the area representing it. He seems very willing to move from one hold to another. He doesn't hold on necessarily to the last moment. No, no. That again is a, is a, a principle of Judah. Uh, hold tightly, but let go lightly. Once it's gone, the position, then not to hang on to it, but to move very quickly to another. on both sides of the body too, able to exercise the control from both sides with equal facility. Bringing the legs in really and the use of the legs is, is one of the main factors in groundwork. I suppose you can do a lot of uh, exercises for the legs. Yes, you can, uh, you can invigorate them like that, but uh, one of the things is response, to be able to respond quickly. He's got his left hand at the back of the collar, it seems. Holding those two points. Yeah, yeah. With, the, with the arm trapped underneath. So he's in fact controlling two corners, one yes, of the hips, one of the shoulders. holding uh, two opposite corners of the cloth. Now that left hand was gripping very tightly and his opponent's arm was sort of wound under his. Yes. And there again, they notice how the legs are being used. They're twined to tell hands. If you watch the legs, you get a that the legs are just as alive as the arms and hands. You notice his legs there, very widely spread, the feet are widely spread. This is uh, cutting off the blood supply to the head rather than the choke. Yes. The main thing is it doesn't do any damage. Even if the man were to become unconscious, refuse to surrender, it wouldn't do him any damage, whereas the boxing knockout can do actual damage. That's the surrender you saw him clapping the hands. That's it again. The moment he becomes a little bit uncomfortable, he claps the hand and stopped immediately. These are neck locks and they're not allowed, they're forbidden. But people should know about these. Things. People should know. It's another one. This is a very tricky one. You have to remember to cross the hands. I think that right hand going yes. in. It's a trauma. Yes, it's a trap. The moment there's any discomfort at all, the surrender's made. And those knees are pinching just to make sure that the man doesn't take his arm out. Yes, actually, if the next thing the legs are holding well, the man will be able to get out. Thank you. 
As a big man, I've never been able to use my legs particularly well. The hold down's all right, but I could never get my legs in. <laughs> well, you'd have to find an even bigger man. <laughs> And again, it's uh, you, well, the judo can be modified indefinitely. Yes, that's not allowed now. Now, that's a typical sort of jujitsu action. I guess depending, depending on surprise, yes. Again, that wouldn't be allowed now. Nor would this that uh, comes in the tender spot on the bottom of the car. But were these. Paralyze the leg. Were they practiced a lot? in your day? Oh yes, yes. They're not so easy to secure, but again, you can surprise people. One of the difficulty I think people have here is walking into it, you know. They tend to get sore knees doing it most of the time. Yes, well, we don't live on the, we don't live on the floor very much. And, uh... I think you settle comfortably into your grip, your hold, pause for a second, and then it seems the man struggles. Yes, then it's put on with a little um, cry, somewhere. and that, that's the signal for him to struggle. Again, these are idealized demonstrations. So the, the hold is secured perfectly, and then the man tries everything. Get out. It's not often you could get such a perfect superiority in position. Round with the left hand gripping the back of the collar. Yes, the, the escaping man's trying hard, he's using the legs. <laughs> and again, surrenders way. Through the head's pushing against his head yes, at the back, yes, important the point there, I think. It's supposed to be like a figure four. Yeah. So, again, it's not so easy to get a perfect position. The thumb, the opponent's thumb is supposed to point upwards. As the man pushes, you let him push, the sort of principle of judo coming out there, isn't it? Yes. practicing the dojo, if you've got a two hour session, um, about one quarter of that is devoted to groundwork. The rest is to tachiwaza most of the time. Yes, I suppose tachiwaza is more most important, especially when you're young. If you don't get a good tachiwaza style when you're young, it's much harder later on. <clears throat> now this again is an idealized system for it can be done at speed, but it's now always done in slow motion. And it's meant to practice balance and uh, coordination. Way, takes the hand over the top, 
could throw the opponent down the back of his head. But that's not taken to that. They just fall up again. Both wrists are held. A turning movement. Then the opponent's lifted up again. Could be thrown down, but the movement is stopped. It's like chess. The actual king is not taken. The move before, the game ends. Is Juno Cutter a recent cutter? Was it devised by Kana or? He, some of the old cutter, um, the old jiu-jitsu cutter, some of these clearly come from jiu-jitsu. They're connected with wrist locks and so on. And the, some of these elements came in Kitoryu, but uh, Kano uh, formalized them. So, so some of these things, a thing like that is probably a couple of hundred years old. Yes, when he moves through with the left hand, you have a feeling yeah. that he's making for the face, the eyes with yes. his left hand. Yes, now if that was done at speed, uh, that blow could actually be dangerous. And they used to practice them at speed too. So there wouldn't be anything against actually doing this quickly? No, no. extremely difficult to do. It's very difficult to keep the balance and the control while they're done. I think most people in Britain today uh, look at the Junokata and um, perhaps can't really um, see why it is done and what it means. If you've been to Japan and you know a little bit about samurai and their armour, perhaps it's more easy to understand. Quite so. Yes, it's a sort of, uh, tends to be rather a sort of survival here of something that's... Uh, that had a meaning, but uh, doesn't necessarily have the same, same meaning now. suddenly hitting, clashing, the reaction? Hey, you have, if you've done a fair amount of judo, yes, you can appreciate it. I think at the beginning this is rather, it seems like a sort of some strange ceremony or ceremonial dance, doesn't it? But uh, if you've done a lot of judo, yes, you appreciate more of it. grades in Japan would know that cutters like the Nagino Kata and Katami no Kata and Juno Kata? Well, the older masters go in for them and perform them very beautifully. And I think now some of the younger, more of the younger champions know them than, than they did uh, in the 1930s. This doesn't need special apparatus. You don't even have to change your clothes to perform it. And uh, it can be done as a form of exercise by two people on ordinary circumstances in a garden, for instance. There are no falls, and the um, clothes are not torn. This one's meant to illustrate uh, cosmic principles. Uh, it's rather difficult to... Rather like the tide and uh, 
a comment coming in. Yes, now you see there's one where two, two uh, heavenly uh, comets uh, meet and circle each other. a grab at the belt and if it's uh, just caught at the right moment the man can be thrown but it's very difficult to find that moment uh, you can spend about a year trying to find the exact moment now this one these are the two these forces the two, the two comments forces, yes through where neither now, wins. Now this is the tidal wave which comes up and hits the rock and then goes back and knocks over the shipping. Hits the rock, comes back and knocks down the shipping. anyone who knew exactly what that was <laughs> but it's not so easy to perform those two forms now as we said when uh, judo first came to britain uh, self-defense was the yes, most important part self-defense it was devised by mr koizumi to show so that you see that lock is visible to an audience and the throw is clearly visible to an audience Again, that would not, this would not be allowed in the judo as a sport, but it's a form of the full forms of self-defense. Now, these are pure uh, jiu-jitsu tricks now, tricks of self-defense, mainly directed against the wrist. that would knock out the man who took the throw. Yes, I remember being told in Japan by a self-defense expert that, uh, you know, one had to be very careful when, if you did actually throw someone, that you must protect the head as much as possible. because yes, they don't know and they panic and the head goes back. tried this in fact and uh, with, a, with a, a dummy gun and in fact the defense can be got on before it can be fired 
It looks very slow here, purely as you say, because it is for demonstration purposes. Yes. Yes, this is done slow motion now. A lot of this kind of technique must have come from Aikido. Aikido came from this. These are old jiu-jitsu tricks, yes. Aikido systematized them. Aikido especially used the, uh, the wrist techniques, yes. It was one school called I Told You in one of the clans. Now this again, the, the methods of defence are such that an audience can easily see them. They pass, he attacks him. Skuinange, that rare throw. Now the man on the right is going to pull a gun. Jacket, isn't it? Yes. The rear. Yes, it's uh, the strain comes at the back of the spine. Comes a wrist lock. The knife's taken away. Getting up, he traps the arm, knocks it. There's so his opponent's elbow right under his arm, it, and he could break it if he just. With the, with the left hand pushing against his face. Yes. against the strangle. 